Well, today, a Track Zone Conversation returns. It's been off for a couple of months. Nothing much has been uh, there to talk about, uh, especially in the realm of Star Trek fan films. But a very special fan film got released this week, and uh, I thought, what better way to talk about it than by bringing in the director of said fan film. He joins me on the other side of this. Really? I, I directed a fan film that got released this week? I know it's... It's surprising to you, isn't it, Mr. Rob Meyer, Robert Meyer Burnett? Welcome back to Trek Zone, my friend. It's, it's good to see you again. And, you know, uh, you're, you're like, I asked you when I first got on, uh, I said, was that a Cooper's you were drinking? And you said, indeed it was. And, um, of course, you know, I spent a year in Sydney back in 2005. And, and Sydney and Tamworth, I should say. Good places. Uh, great places. And Cooper's was my go-to, my go-to lager, my go-to brewski. Well, Rob, as the sun beams through here at the Lion Hotel uh, Beer Garden, I'll fix that camera in a second. Tell us about this fan film uh, that, uh, unbeknownst to you, has been released this week, and you directed it. <laughs> well, it's, it's okay. It's so funny because uh, it took nine years. I mean, I don't think Lawrence of Arabia or Gone with the Wind took, I don't even think Cleopatra took nine years to make. Um, <laughs> so so what, was really, what was really interesting <laughs> is that uh, I heard that, of course, Alec Peters and, and the Axonar Project and Mark Edward Lewis, who worked on Prelude, you know, nine, now 10 years ago. Um, yes. They they I would imagine it's a it's a chunk of their two 15 minute shorts that made their shorts longer. So they they thought, well, this is a good piece. We don't want to lose it. So Mark Edward Lewis took it to his production company so they didn't violate the spirit. I mean, Alec owes Paramount three hundred thousand dollars, but apparently he still thinks it's OK for him to release fan films under the settlement that he made even though he's broken the settlement and 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 now they're going after him in georgia for that money i don't understand why he thinks both things are true that he owes paramount three hundred thousand dollars and it's still okay for him to release two 15 minute shorts but what do i know i'm not a lawyer by training um well, so, Rob, the key that you're missing here is the fact that uh, Alec didn't actually release this. It's under a different production company and it has nothing to do with Alec. Well, it's so funny because he's the writer of the, of the movie. <laughs> and Mark Edward Lewis is the director. And, of course, and now... now to, uh, so, yeah. So what, what happened was when back in 2015... You know, we, we released the Vulcan scene that, that I did as a test run to prove that I could direct the film. And that was that was a proof of concept that I thought was important that we do because Prelude Axnar is it's guys sitting again and a woman sitting against a blue screen talking, you know, and, and I said, look, the important thing is to show that we can actually create movie or at least television quality Star Trek environments and have characters in scenes talking as opposed to just being on a bridge or, or, or being sitting down in front of a green screen. So we did the Vulcan scene and then we used that to raise money, another crowdfunding campaign for the feature that I was now directing. So beginning in September of 2015, I started to uh, work, I was doing two things. I was re there was never a finished Axonar screenplay. Normally when you make a movie, any kind of a feature, you have to have a finished script so you can budget it. So you have to know how much it costs. There was never a finished screenplay. And subsequently, there was never a finished budget for the film either. There was only about the amount of money that we had. And I was under the impression that that money would be put away somewhere, you know, in some escrow account until we started. That was the money we were going to use. And then we would make the movie. That turned out not to be the case. But so I, in order, we didn't have finished sets. Dean, uh, um, Dean was working on those and b doing a great job and building all the sets. And I figured, well, there is something I can be doing. So I was directing the visual effects sequences first. And I was sitting in my office and I was playing with Starship models. And my whole thing was, what is this movie supposed to be about? Okay, obviously it's about the Battle of Axnar, but really it's about Garth of Izar. And my thing was, okay, so we need to see in this movie the seeds of what's going to happen to Garth later that we saw in the third season Star Trek episode, Whom Gods Destroy. And it was a very tragic story. He was apparently a very revered starship captain. He was an explorer that later became known for the Battle of Axanar and, and, and his prowess in battle. And my whole thought process was that wouldn't it have been interesting if Garth 
he was an incredible explorer. He knew so much about stellar and planetary mechanics and, and how the, the physics of space worked. And what was terrifying is that when he was thrust into a situation where he was now in battle, he was able to draw on with an almost supernatural precision. He was able to draw on what he'd learned as an explorer in space and use those things, use the physics of planets and asteroids and comets as battle tactics, as as ways of um, fighting. And it turned out that he was really good at it and it disturbed him. And the first thing you were going to see in Axanar was uh, in the movie, you were going to see the Ares and it was spinning through space, very 2001-esque. And you were going to hear a Garth of Izar, Garth's voiceover, and he's composing a letter to one of his dead crew members, to the, uh, the crew member's parents, and listening to Izarian music. So, and you saw that. So that was the first shot that I was working with, Tob with Tobias. I said, look, I want the cameras to always be moving, and I want the ships to always be moving in ways we haven't seen before. Because normally on, in, when you watch science fiction movies, everything is on what we call a space lake. Everything is on kind of a one-dimensional plane where everybody's fighting as if they're above the ground or something. Whereas, as Nicholas Meyer famously wrote in, in Star Trek II uh, about Khan himself, his pattern indicates two-dimensional thinking. So one of the things that I wanted to do was show us space combat like we've never seen it before. Like, why does a capital ship have to go nose-to-nose -nose with a ship? Why can't a Klingon battlecruiser come out uh, perpendicular uh, at a 90 degree angle on top of another starship. And that's one of the things that I was going to do. And one of the things that was in the script that was given to us, the unfinished Axnar script was this idea of an Icarus maneuver. And I'm like, well, what is the, what is that? What does that mean? I mean, obviously there's the mythological Icarus flies too close to the sun, his, his wax wings burn off and he falls back to earth. And I'm like, okay, well, that's cool. So, so what would an Icarus maneuver using that as a metaphor, what would it be? And I was thinking, I was thinking, because I'm a Star Trek, complete Star Trek nerd, in Vonda McIntyre's Star Trek novel, The Entropy Effect, which is the first Star Trek novel published by Pocket after Star Trek The Motion Picture came out, they, they, they released Gene Roddenberry's novel, and then they released The Entropy Effect. There were these really interesting sequences I remembered when I was 12 years old reading this book, where Sulu was really great at the Starship Combat Simulator. And he was able to turn, he was able to flip starships end over end in combat. And I was like, wow, you know, because you're thinking about these capital ships and how they move. And the way they've been portrayed on screen is they're like sailing ships. They're big and they're slow and they get into close quarters like the Reliant and the Enterprise. It's almost as if they're, it's master and commander and they're using cannons to shoot each other's starboard and, and, and starboard or something, you know, and um, port side, whatever. And, and, I was like, well, that's that's cool, and we have to keep that idea, but if we're playing with the X, Y, and Z axis, and I was thinking, okay, well, what, and I was like, the Icarus maneuver would be a maneuver, and this is what it was in my mind. You pick a point in space, and that point in space in the X, Y, Z axis is the star, is the sun, and the point is, is to, to, to tumble your ship over to that point in space that would essentially quote unquote burn your wax wings off and then it allows you to go back 180 degrees right back on whatever's behind you if there's a pursuer if it's a battleship or something or if it's you need to blow up a comet or something or whatever it is and i i was thinking in my mind and the thing is the icarus maneuver was something that was already established by starfleet it was already something that existed it wasn't something that garth of Izar made up you know, it was this thing, but it was a very difficult maneuver. So I'm like, in this sequence, it's the first sequence where you see Garth in battle. And what happens is they use the Icarus maneuver. They, they, the, the Ares hears that there's a convoy that's been attacked. They, they rush to the convoy's aid, but they get there too late. And they're, they're searching through the debris field for any survivors or lifeboats or anything. And these two Klingon battle cruisers come out of the debris field behind them and, uh, what I what we came up with, what Bill Hunt actually wrote, was something called the Dragon Claw Maneuver. And I'm like, well, what's that? And, and I figured, okay, well, wouldn't it be cool if you had two Klingon battle cruisers up, upside down from each other, so they're not together, not like in a wolf pack, but one's totally upside down because you're in space. 
So it doesn't matter that you're upside down. And these two ships yeah. would come together, double their yield against the rear flank of a, of a starship. And so what would happen is while the Ares is fighting off these two ships, it, what they were able to do is damage the ships, use the Ares maneuver or use the Icarus maneuver, flip back around and dive toward this Klingon battle cruiser. And, and, and Bill and I, Bill and Bill, I think it was Bill who came up with the idea of that. Wouldn't it be funny if, if like the Ares cut a warp nacelle off of one of the battle cruisers, grab it with the tractor beam and then use its kinetic energy and throw it into the into the boom into the bridge of the other d6 and i was like bro that's that's fucking phenomenal i mean I, that's <laughs> that's awesome and so what i did was i was designing all of these effect shots and now we had a finished script we were working off of we knew what scene numbers they were for and it was the effects were designed they were longer the shots were long so i would intercut the shots because the way I cut prelude is I intercut everything so the shots would run long so Tobias could do them all as one shot but the point was that we were going to intercut we, were, we would cut up the shots and then intercut to the various uh bridge crew so we get to learn the bridge crew and their roles by focusing on them and they're doing what they're doing at that particular moment and because the 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 shots were so fluid what I wanted to do was I can't stand whip pans that are unmotivated. I can't stand shaky cam. Um, the only reason that you would you would do a whip pan is like if you're if you're going from one crew member who's giving you one bit of information and then you pan over quickly to another crew member who's giving you another and they're working in tandem to do something. But in my mind, you wouldn't use whip pans. Each intercut was going to be a single character and the camera move whatever the move would be, the camera move on the inside of the ship would continue the exterior move. So it would pan up to someone's face and they would be like locking phasers, you know, and then you'd come out and you'd see the ships come in and you'd come back in and somebody would say phasers locked. And then a couple of intercuts later, and that's how the scene was designed. And the idea of the kinetic, uh, the idea of throwing the warp nacelle, once the warp nacelle was cleaved off the D6, it was Garth who says, you know what we can do? You know, he would be the one going, okay, you're going to use the tractor beam, grab this, plot a course around, we're going to come around. So it showed, the whole point of the scene was to show how Garth could improvise in a moment's notice. And he had this idea of, I, I can smash through their shields. Shields deflect mm -hmm. energy weapons, but a shield can't defend against, I mean, it can push asteroids out of the way, you've got navigational deflectors. But if we're dragging, if we're dragging a, a giant piece of metal, a giant engine, at half impulse power and throw it into, there's nothing I can do, you know? So it's gonna smash through the ship. And the whole point of this entire scene was Garth of Izar improvising something at a moment's notice that was based in physics and astral mechanics. And it showed, and it was, it, they, he, he murdered a bunch of Klingons. So the whole point of that is afterwards, he shocked by this, like the reality of what's going on and how it worked you saw in his face at the end of the scene that he's not go he's not okay with this this is not a victory like he's an explorer and the klingons have a rich culture and and all that but now he's been tasked to fight a war and when i watched <laughs> so these these scenes that i apparently absconded with that alec never had even though i copied them all onto drives and gave them to him and left them i mean the whole point was we didn't have any backups for all the Axnar stuff. So for the record, I've said this a million times, but I copied everything over and gave it to him. And he had it in his office for the better part of a year. All of the footage, every single bit, because I had made it all. You know, I didn't shoot the original Prelude stuff, but I edited all the Prelude stuff. So I had all, everything that I had done on the Axnar project, every single thing, from Prelude to the DVD and the Blu-ray to all of our podcasts, so everything was on these two drives that I asked him to buy for me so I could back them up for him. And they were in his office until we moved to until he moved to Atlanta or we moved out of our office in the 1st of May in 2017. So they released this movie and, and it comes out, the Icarus Maneuver. And I'm watching this and I realized these guys don't, they don't know what the Icarus Maneuver is, one. They don't understand it. And they think that the cleaving of the, the engine and then throwing it at the Klingon battle cruiser that that was the Icarus maneuver. Well, how does that, 
what does that have to do with Icarus, the legend, you know, yeah. flying too close to the sun? And and so I'm I'm watching and all the these unmotivated whip pans and all this stuff that that don't really edit together. And I'm like, I, I'm looking at this film and I'm thinking, and when I knew they were using my footage, I I, I wasn't serious, but I was I said, Mark, I'm going to sue you, Mark Edward Lewis. All of this was my work. I worked on these effect shots for months with Tobias for months and we did 80 I think 83 shots and that is not an insubstantial wow. amount of effect shots we did like 83 of them we designed together an entirely new Starbase one and so they're now pretending that I didn't do any of this and that it was oh Tobias designed all these shots I'm like no 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 I was sending him pictures of starships you know I have it all I have it all I have all the correspondence mm -hmm. between the two of us so this was stuff that was done between um, September of 2015, a, a little bit into 2016, because we were trying to finish up as many shots as we could before, after the lawsuit hit, but there was a lot of shots we didn't quite finish. They actually got to Tobias to finish a few of the shots that were unfinished. That We had the animatic. So what we were doing was I would send the description of the shots. I'm like, here's what I'm thinking. And then Tobias would send me back an animatic, which is a real rough animation of the shots and then i would be like ah this is good or that's good let's change this let's change that and then he would send me back another animatic and once the once the animatic was perfect then he would finish the shots or start to finish the shots and so this was done for months you know and and because the sets weren't built and then we got sued so we never shot any of the live action so when i saw this footage i i knew that they were using some of my shots they used every one of them they used every single shot in the, in the short film. And, and what's interesting about that is like, if you're in the Writers Guild of America and you write a script, and if you work with another writer and another writer has written at least 30% of that script, he shares writing credit with you. And so Mark Edward Lewis is the director of this. One, he didn't know what the Icarus Maneuver was. I said to him, I even wrote to him. I said, if you can tell me what the Icarus Maneuver was and where it came from, I'm, I'm certainly happy to, I'll, I won't say anything more about these effects. And I gave him my videos, because you can see him online. I made videos three years ago of all of my effect sequences and everything that was done. The funny thing was, all of these videos, I had to make a video during the lawsuit of every bit of work that I had done on the feature film. So I had to make this video, free of charge, I might add, that was going to be uh, entered into the record of the lawsuit. So all of my work and all the work that Tobias and I were doing was entered into the record of the lawsuit back in 2016. So this is not something that Alec didn't know because I was bringing him down and I'm like, look at these effect shots, dude, this is amazing. And I, I, was, I was showing him all of this stuff because we were good buddies. You know, we were making this thing together and I was, I was completely obsessed by making this movie because how am I gonna, I, I was never gonna make a Star Trek movie in my life. And so this was a complete, lifelong fantasy obsession of mine and yeah. the, the important thing was i had reasons for all this like i it was all i'd made up and bill hunt was rewriting the script and we were going back and forth and discussing like what what, what could we do here that we haven't seen before and and alec was not involved in any of this process at all he, he, he can't be bothered you when you sit down with alec he's interested in what you're saying for three or four minutes and then he checks out he starts looking at his phone it's really frustrating to meet with him because he's not that particularly like I was editing a feature film and he kept coming in and I was editing a feature doing the Vulcan scene. He had no interest in the editorial process. He only wanted to see something finished. He didn't want to look at like, I've spent eight hours cutting this. He doesn't want to see any of that. Just show me the finished thing, which is, you know, mm. what a lot of people do, I guess. And similar stories as well from like Dean Newberry, who was a set designer as well, uh, that Alec just really wasn't interested in uh, what you had to say, what you were doing. It just had to be done and his name had to be put on it. That's another thing. Dean it was obsessed with his sets as I was with like the visual effects and the shots. And, and we look at the bridge now that they're shooting on and it's not finished. Like the, the lights that go underneath the view screen that go, doo -doo 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 -doo, they, they call them the Cylon lights. Those were never there. And where the piece, the bridge is, is modular, so you can take it apart. Well, when they join, there's supposed to be metal, metal strips that go down in the, that cover that, those, those, where the joins of the pieces. They never did that. And when you're, when you're looking like, I was looking at the short film, like with the yellow alert sign, I'm like, I'm like guys, 
you guys and and Dean and I were plotting like, okay, we're gonna do this and we're gonna do this to the bridge. We're gonna do all kinds of things to it. I remember once um, Milton Santiago, the director of photography, was up and Dean was there, and we're looking at paint chips about what how we're gonna paint the bridge, you know, and 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 we're looking like and and we had cameras and we were doing tests like which colors would look best and we Milton had two different cameras so we were deciding where we're going to use an airy or were we going to use a red to shoot to shoot the movie and it was like with the Vulcan scene when we were doing the Vulcan scene we I did a camera test because we shot natural light we brought out a Soval's costume and we brought out Talera's costume in the middle of the parking lot in the hot sun and we brought out both cameras and we shot we're shooting these costumes under natural light the way we'd shoot to see what looked better under which with cameras because cameras shoot differently and airy shoots differently than a red and alec was like what are you doing and we're like we're doing a camera test and he was just like what it was it, it, like he had no and the same thing was true like oh i'm gonna paint the bridge whatever color i want to paint the bridge and i'm like dude we're making a movie like like i don't care what color you want to paint the bridge we have to think about what's going to be best for the film that we're making like that's yeah. the whole point of you know, and and I think the what was what was so interesting about all this is he's been pillaring me for seven years online, and talking about I didn't do this, I didn't do that, I stole this, I stole that, and and while it's annoying to hear all of it's a bunch of BS because I've continued to work, I have a second feature film I'm finishing up now, and I've done so much work uh, since then, and and but it's it, it's frustrating to have worked with somebody, and who was there when I was being fanatical about my process. And I was deeply, deeply into making this movie the best it could be. Mm. And then to see the work that I had done get used in a way where the people using it didn't even understand what was, what, what the point of it all was, you know, they didn't even, they, they don't, there's no even, there's very few edits in there. I don't know if there's any edits. They just took the effect shots and cut them all together thinking that was the way, like if Mark Edward Lewis had called me up and said, he one day when he was working on mind sifter he called me up and asked me to come down and look at some stuff and i gave him some editorial notes nothing big you know and he incorporated them in, into the movie and he thanked me he said ah, i never would have thought to do it that way and i'm like well you know i have been cutting motion pictures since 1993 and he was very <laughs> compliment yeah he's very complimentary and was really nice about it and um but he never called me about any of this stuff. And I understand why, because now the battle lines are drawn. But, you know, as as filmmaker to filmmaker, he might have called and said, well, what were you thinking when you did all these things? Because he was quick to say when when I said, oh, oh I'm good. He said he wrote to me, he said, if you want to sue me, go right ahead. You know, and I said, look, man, um, I, I think now that I'm I know that all of my work is being used, it stings a little that it's being used by the same asshole who's been pillaring me for seven years. When I stood by him during this fucking lawsuit. Yeah. I remember those times, Rob. I know. And and I was I was I was staunchly on team Alec Peters. Actually I was staunchly yeah. on the axe in our feature film. But I think I think things started to go south between us personally. After the lawsuit was settled, we had a meeting and it was on Valentine's Day in twenty twenty seven or twenty twenty seven. In twenty seventeen. And Mike Bodden had flown into town and, and there was a couple other people there and we're, we're, we were deciding what we were going to do. And I said, well, look, we can only do 30 minutes. And I said, we've already seen the documentary style film. And in my mind, we were never going to duplicate that because we didn't have Tony Todd. We didn't have Richard Hatch. So we didn't have the star power that Prelude has. You know, we might get a few people back, even if you got new actors. Tony Todd's a genre favorite, and so is Richard Hatch. So it'd be very difficult. So we don't have the star power to rely on. So what we, what we can do is actually make a feature film. And we'd already done the Vulcan scene. I was planning on reshooting the Vulcan scene against our giant curved green screen that we'd made in the studio. And uh, we never shot anything in front of that. And we were going to shoot the opening Klingon sequence when the Klingons are on this captured planet. And we were going to shoot, I was going to reshoot the Vulcan scene with different camera moves. And um, we never got to do any of that. But Alex said, well, then we're not going to be able to tell the story of, of the Battle of Axnar. And I'm like, well, we're not in a position where we're going to get to make the feature film anyway. So we promised donors we were making a feature film. We did not promise them we were going to make two 15-minute shorts. 
Now, Alec will tell you now, he'll say that the, well, the, 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 the donors have spoke spoken and they want to see this. And I'm like, you know what? The donors would have loved seeing a 30 minute movie and, and you just don't want to do it. And, you know, to be fair, it's his project. But w the whole point was that we, we needed to do something bigger and better doing, doing more documentary style stuff is, is that's not what people paid for. And that doesn't show, it doesn't advance our cause. I guess it's nice to see visual effects out there. Not that I'll, I'll ever get any credit for them, but they're nine years old. You know, there's things that could have been refined and done better and, oh, well. And, and I think the biggest thing with it, uh, I, I have seen it and my, res my reaction to it is Starships Go Brr. It, it, there's no story hearing how you had envisaged this whole sequence to be. It, it, it was storytelling in and of itself that the characters were just kind of those little extra pieces to, to help flesh it out. But those visual effects, it, 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 it was a story in itself and that's been lost in this case. It's just a matter of, it's almost, we have these visual effects, which I'm pretty sure Alex said that you stole and never gave to him. And now they're appearing in every form of media uh, that they're producing, uh, which is you know interesting. And, and that kind of story disappears as well. That they have these visual effects and now they kind of have to marry live action to it uh, in any way that, that kind of works, whether it works or not. Well, and it's funny because we were, Bill Hunt and I, it was all in our script. You know, it was all there and, and, and it was, it was designed on purpose because we were normally do visual effects later, but we were going to have those visual effects on set, you know, and we we're going to say, mm -hmm. okay, here's the line of dialogue. Here's the camera move that's on the visual effect. We're going to cut into whomever we were going to cut into, and we're going to continue whatever move that we're seeing in the visual effect. So it'd be like a hard cut. So you would see the camera would be moving or the ship would be moving and the, the camera would jump inside the bridge and continue that move over up nice. to anyone who was there. So every, every move in that sequence was going to be defined by the visual effects at first. And then it, it would, there would be a story beat. Every time you cut to a person, there should be an, a story beat. Something should be conveyed to us. And it would be, um, um, everything would be telling part of that story. You would be learning something about every character during the sequence and especially about Garth because you'd have to, the whole thing is about Garth in his mind, he's getting this information from his crew and he's the one that makes the decision. Okay. We can grab that in an instant. He's like, we can grab that warp nacelle and we can use it as a, um, as a bludgeon and and that was yeah. something that that he and you would have seen it you would have seen in his eyes like aha there would have been an aha moment and his crew would then be oh my god this is we've never seen this before you know and and that was something that that uh at the end of the thing well i've never seen that before that was we came up with that you know and and it mm. i mean on one hand i'm i guess i should be happy that those those effects saw the light of day but it was the the whip pans inside the ship are totally incongruous with the elegant sweeping camera moves and the way it doesn't work you know you're going from these these camera these effect shots that were made to be one way and then you're going in for these these really unmotivated whip pans all around the bridge and i'm like why is the why is the the camera in one place why aren't you why aren't you below a character and why don't you come up from the bottom to someone's face and then move over to somebody else? You know, it's, it seemed very haphazard. It was very, yeah. it was very not, there was no motivation there. Or maybe there was, it just didn't come off very well. It was very nauseating, I, I, I think is, is, a, is an apt description. Uh, it's for hard to watch. It's really hard to concentrate on and, and wonder yeah. what, what, like, what's going on here. And I'm not being critical also, just to be critical. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. But this is the other thing as well, and this is something that will be panned uh, by the Axanar supporters that eventually come along to this video, that, that we're just hating on this, and, and that's not the case. It's This is critiquing the filmmaking. The other thing for me as well that I noticed was it, it looked like that the um, the film gate wasn't uh, considered when, when shooting. There's a lot of cropped heads, uh, poor framing, uh, and, and stuff like that. Just Just these little things. It, well, what's interesting is Axanar has a specific 
video resolution. So uh, we finished Axonar in 2K. So it's it's officially like there's there's official sizes for things. Axonar because we finished in 2K is 2048 by 858 pixels, and that is 2K widescreen. Like if you watch Star Wars or something, it's officially widescreen. Um, and so those visual effects were finished at that that aspect ratio. So when you're shooting, you should be shooting at that aspect ratio. You know, you should be shooting at 2048 by 858. And there's no reason to have people's heads cut off. You know, if, if the, that's that's a mistake, that's that's bad camera work. And um, what you should be able to do is is fix that. They should have been able, I mean, it looks like they shot it in like five minutes. And um, yeah. uh, it's unfortunate because it's very incongruous with the visual effects. It doesn't work. It's an entirely different style. And um, as from these very composed, sort of beautifully sliding, elegant shots to then you're in these whip pans in the bridge, and it looks like everyone in the bridge doesn't know what they're doing. The camera should be coming into people and showing that they know exactly what they're doing. But with a camera whipping around, it's 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 giving the the viewer, uh, it's telling the viewer it's frantic in there when it shouldn't be frantic. These people are the best. Yep. Cut, 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 cut. Boom, 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 boom. They know exactly what they're doing. This is a military yep. vessel that's battle hardened with a crew that yep. knows exactly what they're supposed to do. As a matter of fact, they should be anticipating each other's actions. Like one person does something, the other person has to react. And they are, it's like you're, you should be watching a symphony and Garth is the yeah. conductor. And that was the whole point of the sequence. And what I'm looking at, I'm like, well, they didn't get that. It was supposed to show Garth is a great military commander. This is the first time in, in the movie that we were making where you see him in battle and what he's able yeah. to do. And for my mind, it's kind of the way of the warrior. Um, there's no whip panning around the ops room uh, there in, in Deep Space Nine. It's it's these hard cuts. It's everyone has their line and they're almost talking over the top of each other because it is that symphony, uh, in this case, orchestrated by Captain Sisko. Uh, and in the Icarus maneuver, it should have been orchestrated by uh, Garth. And that this is what we need to do. We're in here. We're fighting these two Klingons. Yeah, that might be a surprise in the beginning if they've jumped on us, but... From then on, we know what we need to do here. We need to fight to win, uh, and it's just not conveyed. It for for this thing that has taken ten years to produce, and the the screams of professionalism and everything else like that. This comes off as a very uh, amateur fan film, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Star Trek fan films are the best when they're amateur, but. This thing, Axanar is trying to be more than it actually is because everyone that is professional has run away from Alec uh, even after he's sweet-talked them into, into working for him and with him. I mean, for me, I have to say that I, I went in with an open mind wondering what they were going to do with the effects. You know, I was really curious to see how they would, would, um, would use them. But to me, it was really, really disappointing because... You know, it, it, there's nothing happening. There, there's no storytelling, like you'd said, but it, there's no character development. I mean, in a scene like this, you should always be telling an audience about, you, you should always be learning something new about Garth, and you should be learning something about the bridge crew. You should be learning something about those crew members, even though you're in battle. And there was another sequence. And by the way, you can see all these sequences if you want the way I was. And you can hear my thought process. I mean, I whipped through them, but there's audio commentary. I did three Axnar Origins discs, uh, three Axnar Origins documentaries, little, little behind the scenes clips. Some are longer mm -hmm. than others that go through all of these things. And I'm explaining what it all means. And it's funny. I'm like, anybody could have, they could have watched those. <laughs> it's like they've been online yeah. for... You know, one of them has 150,000 views. So it's like, you know, they were there for all to see. And they're yep, certainly yep. aware of those effects because they've been using them. They've been, they've been, they've taken those, those things and used them over and over and over and over and over again on the Axonar channel. I just, I'm, I'm yep. really disappointed that there's so little substance there. And there's another yep. sequence that we designed where we go into a gas giant and this gas giant uh, we, the, uh, Garth draws this Klingon battlecruiser, a D seven into this gla gas giant because the, the, he knows, he understands that the captain of that Klingon vessel is not really aware. And if you go down to a certain, it's like crush depth in the ocean. 
if you go into a gas giant and you go deep enough into the atmosphere, you're going to hit the hard deck. You're going to literally crash into the atmosphere. And, mm-hmm. you know, Bill Hunt and I spent a long time figuring all this stuff out, like how far down can they go? And so Garth knows how to do this and basically lays a trap. And it was showing how can you destroy a Klingon battle cruiser? Not necessarily. I mean, there was mines involved, but by drawing him too deep into the gravity well of a gas giant. And that was another thing. That was Garth using stellar mechanics or planetary mechanics as a battle tactic. And that was the whole point of of what was going on there. But Alex's not interested in any of that. You know, he wants he thinks Garth's Patton. Patton, you know, his favorite character that he bought a costume for. You know, and, and yep. I don't even think that he understands why Patton's a good movie. You know, it's just he likes Captain America and he likes Patton and he likes these these heroic figures. <laughs> I'm like, but but these characters, Star Trek characters are not Star Trek characters aren't Patton. You know, they're not that. There's something else. And and Garth doesn't wind up in a good place. And so it's we're trying to show you the seeds that were planted of why I mean we don't tell the story in the movie, but why could someone who's so great at battle and was so decisive and was so pivotal, he had such a pivotal role in this victory for the Federation, why did what happened to him happen to him? Why did he become corrupted and why did he go insane? And some of that was the guilt he felt at how good he was at killing Klingons. At least that's the way it was in my mind. And it was a guilt he it's- took with him for the rest of his life. Yeah, it's kind of like the um, the minutia, the the intricate detail of Garth of the story of Axena has been lost to the sands of time. Dare I, dare I use that analogy? But it, it really does seem like now it's just kind of this starships go burr. <laughs> yeah, and and you know there was people on on the Axe Monitor site that read the script and were, were critical of it. And and the, of the one that Bill and I were working on, but we were not finished with it. But 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 they were not incorrect, and we always the whole point was to keep rewriting and rewriting, like any great script. You know, you keep rewriting. Like you you might have all the locations done. You know, you're going to be on the bridge, so it doesn't necessarily affect the budget. But you can rewrite mm-hmm. a scene and make it better and better and better, and try and convey what you're doing. I mean, we knew that we only had a certain amount of locations that we were going to shoot this movie on. So you could you could say, okay, we, we know where we're going to be, but that doesn't mean we can't rewrite these scenes and make them better. And then when you have actors get together and do a reading, you change it again to give them lines that more suit what they are better at saying. So screenwriting is very iterative. And that was something that, that Alec also never, you know, there's the famous picture where we show the first, oh, here, here's the script, it's locked. And I'm like, it's not locked. It's the first time we ever had a finished screenplay. There was never a finished Axanar script until here's a screenplay you can actually read that says fade in and the end. <laughs> there never yeah. was one before. Yeah. And we're like, look, you know, it was not locked. Certainly wasn't. There's no such thing. Yeah, exactly. Now, Rob, um, it, as is the case with anybody telling the truth about what actually transpired during their time with Axanar, uh, Alex, come back around to the threats of legal action against you. Uh, what are your thoughts on his current bravado almost as it is at the moment he's he's definitely going to sue you now i mean he sued me twice you know he's come after me twice he sued me in georgia i now have on video that he sued me in the wrong jurisdiction and he said it was a legal tactic i have Mm -hmm. now all this information and i'm going to say if he sues me in california there's slap laws he's already come after me before he sued me in georgia in the wrong jurisdiction he knowingly said to the court that, you know, because when you say you're suing somebody, you have to, are you sure it's in the right jurisdiction? Yes, sir, I am. So he intentionally sued me in the wrong jurisdiction. We have all of that. If he wants to try and sue me again, sue me. There's also the statute of limitations. You know, there's only so long you can sue people. And if he's accusing me of criminality, go to the police. Go to the police. You constantly accuse me of theft. You say I st- stole tens of thousands of dollars. That's a felony. And I stole $50,000 of equipment. That's a felony too. Why don't you call the police? If I've committed a criminal act, you keep trying to sue me. You know, you, your, your lawsuits aren't, don't have merit because you don't have the evidence to back it up. And, and now we have all of his bank accounts. Like, like his bank accounts show all of the payments he made to me from Axinar. Mm-hmm. He paid my company. So I can just go in and, and I have all of this. I have all of this stuff. 
You know, I don't know if he gets all that, that we have all this. Like he keeps saying, our, our books are open. I, are they, Alec? I mean, like, I yeah. actually have your bank accounts. I have them all. Like, I have them all. Mm. I've already prepared a defense if he comes after me legally again. I don't think he quite understands that. And he already owes Paramount $300,000. And it's like, and, and what does he hope to achieve? Like, he's going to sue me for what? I mean, if you're accusing me of, if you're accusing me of criminal behavior, Alec, call the police. Call the police. Because he does. He accuses me of stealing 80,000. Actually, yeah. I don't know because it changes every time. There's different it's, amounts every single time. And, and what's interesting is now I have the proof, all this money that he says I stole from him. It's like, oh, it's all right there. You know, here it is. The transfers are right here. You know, you can now see them all. It's such a weird, it's such a weird thing. Like, and I don't understand, like, he also knows that I have, I have a family, you know, and just like Paul Jenkins did. And he just says the way he casually um, wants to hurt people. It's, it's, it's unconscionable. I think that the, the, the Paul Jenkins situation is not going to go the way he thinks it's going. We'll see. It's yeah. going to be really interesting to see. And it's, 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 it's very interesting. I mean, the fact that he should also realize that CBS, they're, they're not going after him in Georgia for money. So he doesn't really, I don't think he really, he, he's so used to getting away with all this stuff. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I just don't want, finish your movie, dude. Like finish yeah. the movie. Yeah. Finish the movie and put it yep. out. <laughs> and then and everything then go, else is a distraction. Then go do something else. I mean, it, it's like you're going to sue more people and then you're going to use that as an excuse why your movie isn't done. It's do you know that the beginning of May, which is in a month, it'll be 10 years since principal photography began on Prelude to Axanar. 10, a decade. I don't think there's ever wow. been anyone in Hollywood history who's been so ineffectual at getting two 15 minute short films made. I mean, and the funny thing was, is we shot Axanar in the first week of May. I was given uh, Axanar to, to prelude to Axanar to cut. And we showed it at the premiere in a movie theater in San Diego, two and a half months later, two and a half months later, we shot it and delivered it at its premiere two and a half months later. And um, I don't understand. I, I mean, they should be able, and, and Axanar was shot over three days, two days with all the blue screen stuff. And then there was a few pickups. I don't understand how many, how many shoots have they had? I mean, wouldn't you, it, it's wild to me. I'm like, you only need two days to shoot those movies. Why have you not shot them yet? It's, it's bizarre. Like you made Prelude, the thing that you love most in the world, you shot it in two days with a few pickup shots on a third day. And then we delivered it in a movie theater two and a half months later. You yeah. should at least be able to do that. It's been 10 years. And then there's all these people that, uh, it, the, the syncophonic, um, you know, fans of all this, I'm like, why don't you call them on that? If nothing else, if you can't make two 15 minute shorts with two days of principal photography, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're doing. You're pro it's profligate spending. It's a lifestyle choice that you've made. You're not being honest with your donors. You're not being honest with yourself. You're not being honest with anybody because we did it before in two days and with a couple of pickups and we finished in two and a half months. I mean, and now they're going, well, we might not have it done by, by, uh, we should, if they've already shot they're, they've already had more time. If, if they only use what their last shoot was and they can't get it done by July for Comic-Con, they failed utterly again. They keep failing. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's as, as Alex, like, you know, your friends won't even hire you in Hollywood. Well, that's because I hired them, but, but I get everything I am supposed to do finished. Like we get everything done. It gets finished. Yeah. Alex, like, you didn't yeah. finish the Axe in Our Origins disc. I paid you $5,000 to do. Well, one, you didn't pay me $5,000 to do it. And two, that disc was supposed to be about the making of the Axe in Our feature film that never got made. So how do you make a making of about a movie that didn't ever actually get made? And the closest thing that did get made are my videos that I put up on the YouTube channel. The Axe in Our Origins, part one, two, and three. If I was still on the project, it would have been finished in 2017. And we, who knows where it would have been now, but it was certainly wouldn't have been, it's just, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. 
and the level of competency is on display with the uh, Icarus maneuver. Just this whole thing, once again, I say it every time we talk Axanara on Trekzone, that this whole sordid affair uh, did not need to be what it has become, if not for the ego of one man. Uh, and again, on full display here, a, a lack of understanding of where you and Bill were going with the script, with the way that those visual effects were shot. Uh, and we have this product that the sycophants think is the greatest thing since sliced bread, beats anything that Paramount is releasing on Star Trek uh, at the moment. Um, and yet, it critically, it, it's not that great at all. But I will also counter that by saying, hey, there has been Axanar content released, and at least this time, there isn't a forged signature on a talent release form. There isn't a, a reshoot. Uh, there is a discussion at the moment about redoing the credits, so we could be seeing a second version of the Icarus Maneuvre uh, being released. We got up to, I think, version four of Interlude, so I wonder how many versions we'll see uh, of the Icarus Maneuvre, because you can't just finish it off and, and make sure everything is good before you release it. I mean, theoretically, uh, the interlude short and the Icarus maneuver are not in the spirit of the settlement. Just because exactly. someone else exactly. made it, they're, they're trying to do this like, what, you, you think you're tricking the studio? They came after you hard to get that hundreds of thousands of dollars that you owe them. They're gonna continue to go after you. What if they were to say, okay, you're done. You made your two movies. Good night, Irene. Yeah. That's certainly their yeah. prerogative, and, and I wouldn't be surprised if they say that, and then Alec can walk away into whatever life he's going to lead after this. But um, I, 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 I think that could be coming. Uh, I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me. There's two movies that they've made, and it, it, they don't, you know, this. I, it's so weird because the, the studio, they get to tell you what you're going to do. And if they write you a cease and desist and say, you're done, you violated the settlement. We just, we have a judgment against you because you violated the settlement and you think somehow you're going to continue to make movies. Like, why do you think, like, I don't understand why he even think that's, thinks that's the case. He's violated the settlement, which means the settlement that they gave him to make two 15 minute shorts is, isn't that null and void? I mean, that's why they got their judgment against him because he violated the settlement. So does that mean the settlement still exists? I don't, I wouldn't necessarily think it does. And not only that, you know, Alec, Alec has made copyright strikes against my content on YouTube. Yes. And by doing that, he yes. couldn't prove it, but he's done DCM takedowns on, and, and the thing about YouTube is when you uh, strike a channel, that is an actual legal action. And that is part of the public record. And he's done it more than once. So uh, in terms of frivolous law, uh, lawsuits, slap laws, I don't think he realizes that if you look into what YouTube allows, he's, he's on very thin ice. Yeah, I, I wish, and this is a completely separate topic, but I wish that YouTube would deal with the DM, DCMA uh, obligations a little bit better uh, because Alec can just do this um, and, and then it's, it's on the content creator to then um, dispute it and have everything reinstated, but that takes time and, and money if you're that way inclined. And, and we're not just talking about Alex striking you, but people doing it on other, on other content that they don't like, uh, time and money. And it's part of the reason that this chat today doesn't feature anything, uh, doesn't feature any overlay of the Icarus Maneuva, so there's nothing to strike. This is all original Trek's own content. This is a chat between you and I, Rob, and that's why where there are pretty critical parts where uh, where people are going to be saying, well, show us what you're talking about, I'm not going to do that. And I'm not even going to show um, footage from your clips that you made a few years ago uh, because it, it completely... You'll see them completely, on my channel. Exactly. Yeah. Links, links down below, and, and there are offline copies of those as well. So even if Alec does strike them down, uh, they will exist, and they'll exist on servers where Alec can't just strike them down for, for existing. The thing is, you can't strike those, that content because it's Star Trek content that's already, the lawyers have already said that Paramount owns it. So when he does that, and he did that on my last channel, he did that on a show I was doing with Paul Jenkins, that showed Star Trek material, that means he's claiming ownership over Star Trek. So he can't take, eventually after 30 days, the content will come back. I disputed it and it came back sooner. 
but he has to be very careful when he makes those strikes because he, he won't be allowed back on YouTube and they'll take his channel down. And if they do that, all the content's gone. Gone forever. Uh, somebody said to me, yep. you know, are you going to strike the, the, uh, the Icarus maneuver? Uh, are you going to strike that, with a, hit it with a copyright strike? And I'm like, no, I'll let it speak for itself. What I do love about YouTube is that, uh, and I see it in my analytics, uh, Axinar channel content uh, in the recommended videos down to the side, Trek Zone, recommended Trek Zone videos afterwards. So I just think that that is brilliant. And there is nothing that Alec can do about that. That is the YouTube algorithm working wonders. Uh, so I look forward to people joining us uh, from the Icarus Maneuver coming over and checking this out and seeing the real director of the oh, Icarus I mean, on, Maneuver. On, on one hand, I mean, it's flattering that they didn't go back and like, I would have thought if I was directing something, if I was Mark Edward Lewis, I would want to make all, like he said, why well, wouldn't, I didn't watch your effects. I'm like, okay, then why didn't you go do new ones? Get somebody to do new effects for you. Like, it's problem solved. If you didn't like my effects and what I was doing, clearly you didn't understand what I was trying to do. But okay, just go make your new go make new effects. It 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 seems it, it's interesting that Alec would spend seven years pillaring me online, but then turn around and use my work, and then just not mention yeah. it was my work. You know, and and he knew yeah. how much time and effort I put into that stuff. And that's the thing. I mean, that's that speaks to his character or lack thereof. And, you know, now he's, oh, I'm going to talk, I'm going to sue you again. Like, is he proud of suing people? Like, I don't understand. Is that, it's not that, I don't think that's the flex he thinks it is. It's it's not like, why is suing people such a, a good thing? Like, why do you think it's such a good thing? The way he, and look, we now have all those videos. Paul Jenkins made that great cut together scene of him talking about all the lawsuits. I mean, you show that to a judge. They're not going to take kindly to that. People don't like to see the uh, uh, legal system abused. And and now there's enough material out there that Alec has done since I left Axnar, between Dean, between Paul Jenkins, between myself, all these lawsuits, Alec suing me across the country. All you have to do is present that stuff to judges now. Yep. You know, and uh, yep. we'll see we'll see what happens. Well, Rob, looking forward to all of that. Uh, what's ahead? Uh, keeping an eye on the Axnar story as we do on Trexone. Uh, it's not... It, by no means is it the most important part of Trexone uh, like they claim it to be. It, it, it's a fun little sojourn for me uh, to check in with, with what he's doing. Um, and it never ends. It's, it's the content that keeps on delivering. He's the person that keeps on delivering. Uh, and I look forward to more. Uh, this has been going more. on for a decade. That's a huge percentage of my life on this planet. Yes. I had hair a decade ago. And I didn't lose it because of Alec. My hair was not white. <laughs> so there we go. Rob, I appreciate your time. Uh, from, uh, from here at the beer garden uh, of the Lion Hotel in North Adelaide. I hope to make it down under again. Uh, the year I spent in Australia was one of the most fun of my entire life. I have such fond memories. Australia is a great place. And um, from the Gold Coast to Melbourne to the Blue Mountains to Tamworth, <laughs> to Sydney. Uh, it's it's one of my favorite places I've ever been. I love that you said Melbourne correctly too. <laughs> I mean, if I tried to say Brisbane, I would have just it would have been like fingers on a chalkboard for you. Like in Jaws. Yes. I'm going to Brisbane. Yes. <laughs> yes. There um I'm pretty sure there is an Axanar person that did call it Brisbane. Um he shall not be named. Um, but Rob, the next time you and I are in the same city together, the beers are on me. This one is empty. It's time to go back to the bar for now. Rob, thank you so much for joining me. And we'll see you again on another Trek Zone Conversation real soon. Put some cold chisel on the jukebox for me. Hell yeah.